All right. Good morning, church. How are we? Come on in, find a seat. My name is Ryan. I'd like to welcome you to week 11 out of our 12-week series from the book of Philippians called Resilient. If at all possible, I'd like to open up my talks with a story, and one came to mind this week. So a while ago, a buddy of mine told me uh, that he had, uh, had two kids that he brought to the dentist. Child number one, after being attended by the dental assistant person, whatever the technical term is there, was awarded with two stickers for the hell on earth that time at the dentist office can be. So child number one obviously left the office that day uh, with jubilation because went in with no stickers, left with two stats, that's a haul. That's a good day, uh, you know, as far as sticker collecting goes. But unbeknownst to child number one, child number two was just a room away being cared for by another assistant. And at the end of their trial, they were awarded with not two but five stickers. So how do you think that played out? Did child number one rejoice at the fact that they had two stickers while simultaneously being happy for their five-stickered sibling? No, because that's never the way that that works, and you don't have to have kids to know that. Child number one suffered from a temporary bout of insanity and believed that life was no longer worth living unless they could somehow amass the treasure that their sibling had been awarded, and, uh, and, and so the day went. And as, as funny as that sounds, as ridiculous as that seems, if we were honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that there's usually a whole lot more of child number one in us than we either see or are secure enough to admit. Amen? And uh, the reason for this is, is really, we're almost conditioned by our culture to, to think in terms of a child number one. I mean, if you just look at the way that we're advertised to, it's the same basic formula in pretty much every advertisement. We are taught to be discontent with where we are and what we have, and then fed this idea that if we just had, you know, fill in the blank, then life would be worth living, and we would find this elusive, majestic thing that we call contentment. But here's the thing about contentment. I don't like this, but it's the truth. If you can't be content where you are, then you never will be content. As long as we believe that contentment is just on the other side of, you know, fill in the blank, as soon as we get this, or as soon as we don't have to deal with this any longer, as soon as we get to that stage of life, when you begin thinking and living that way, you've doomed yourself to a life of dissatisfaction. And to, to prove my point today, I want to do something that, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think I've ever done before from this stage. I would like to read you a poem. It goes like this. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted. I think you understand where this is going. The colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was now winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. And then it hit, starts to hit a little harder. <clears throat> See if you can't find this relatable. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. Remember thinking that? What a crock. <laughs> Way less freedom when you grow up. I would not recommend it. Also very little respect, just have kids. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. And I thought that I would insert this here to my 20-year-old brothers and sisters. You will not feel mature or sophisticated when you turn 30 because you won't be mature or sophisticated when you turn 30. I was middle-aged. <laughs> I already got one. <laughs> I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired. But it was middle age that I wanted. That's what I like about this poem. It really runs the gamut. I didn't write this either. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted. The presence of mind without limitations. And then it kind of hits pretty hard in this final line. My life was over, but I never got what I wanted. <clears throat> that poem paints a picture of how I feel like on autopilot, every one of us tends to move through life. We all tend to move through life never really finding what we want, believing that it's always just ahead of us or just behind us or just a different version of what we have. 
Uh, the truth is you're never going to find what you want until you learn to be content where you are. And the vast majority of people on this planet, sad as it is to see, they never find that contentment. But the author of this letter, known as Philippians, did find it. He found the contentment that so few people ever find, that maybe some of us this morning are still looking for, at least to one degree or another. And it totally changed his life, completely changed his life when he found it. We read all about it in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. So if your life is perfect this morning, then this will be a large waste of your time. But if you are less than perfectly content in any way, shape, or form, then I think this is going to have something useful for you. Philippians 4, 10 through 14 says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. This is God's word. So if you were here last week, it's amazing how, how different two passages that are right next to each other can be. Last week, we were in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 9 has all kinds of commands and deals with all kinds of different topics. This passage has no commands and it deals with just one topic. It's very easy to summarize what I just read to you. Paul is thanking the Philippians for some gift that they gave him, but then goes on to say that he didn't need it because he found this thing called contentment. So the first thing to figure out in a passage like this is to understand exactly what Paul means when he's talking about contentment. And as simple as that might seem, it's actually pretty difficult to define or even identify contentment. What's a lot easier is to define and identify discontentment because we all know what that looks and sounds like. Discontentment is being unhappy with where you are in life or whatever your present circumstances are. Um, so it's easy to think that contentment is just the opposite of that, that it's being happy about where you are, but that's not entirely true. So what I want to do real quickly here is talk about three counterfeits to contentment that often look and sound like contentment but are not contentment. Number one, this is what contentment is not. Contentment is not happiness. All right, Paul was not happy about the fact that he had to write this letter to the church in Philippi from a Roman jail cell. He wasn't thrilled about that. Paul uh, loved nothing more than being out on the mission field, preaching the gospel, seeing God open people's eyes for the first time, seeing churches get planted, investing in people and developing leaders, and seeing the message go forth. And there's nothing he would have wanted more than to continue to be able to do that. So he wasn't happy when he wrote this passage of scripture, and yet he was content. So contentment is not happiness. Secondly, and this one gets messed up all the time in you know, church culture, contentment is not denial. Contentment is not the product of plugging your ears and closing your eyes and refusing to admit that you are hurt by something that's happened to you that you're experiencing that is, in fact, hurtful. See, when we go through life, and it, if you do this as a Christian, this will be very detrimental to your own personal well-being. But if you do this as a person in leadership, you're going to cause a lot of people a great deal of pain. It's amazing how many times we think that it's spiritual to, to play pretend with what we're really going through. Like, not, like it's not okay to actually talk about that we're hurt, that we're in pain, that we're frustrated, that we're disappointed. But what I love about specifically the book of Psalms is the authors of the Psalms never bothered playing pretend with a God that already knew everything about them. The only way that we process emotion and begin to leave it behind us is by taking it before God in all of its raw honesty. It's not, it's not, spiritu it's not spiritual to play pretend with your feelings. That's, that's not being spiritual. That's being a sociopath. The Bible says that there is a time to mourn. That's a time that's been divinely ordained by God and you're in my life that we should mourn. We should look at things that are not good, that sin has broken and it should cause us to weep. That's why when Jesus stood beside the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he didn't praise God that his sovereign will had been orchestrated in the death of his friend. He cried because things were not the way that they should be. So contentment is not denying the reality of where God has you and how painful that reality might be. But thirdly and lastly here, Contentment is not complacency. Contentment is not just accepting that things are less than they should be and just kind of adopting a fatalistic approach to life. Back in chapter 3 
uh, Paul, despite everything that had gone on in his life, he said because Jesus had taken hold of him, he wanted to take hold of Jesus. And it, it developed this, this insane effort in him that even from a jail cell, he described his life as that of a runner in the Olympic Games, sprinting forward, reaching to the goal. It just, it incited this passion in him to grow and progress and advance. That's not complacency. So contentment is not complacency. So what does it mean? What, when the Bible talks about contentment, what does that word actually mean? And here's what I thought was really interesting. The Greek word that gets translated content or contentment in this passage is not found in, in, its, in this exact form. It's not found anywhere else in the entire Bible. But it comes from another Greek word, um, archaeo. And the definition of that word, this is the very first definition of it, it means to be possessed of unfailing strength. So don't, don't miss this. The definition of that word is not possessing unfailing strength, it's being possessed by unfailing strength. What that means is that when Paul is talking about contentment here, he's not talking about something that he was able to generate within himself by his own power. He's talking about something that came from outside of him. This contentment did not become his when he grabbed a hold of something, it became his when he realized that something had grabbed a hold of him. And what had grabbed a hold of him was this unfailing strength that kept him and guarded him and protected him regardless of what was going on around him. So when we talk about contentment, that's what we're talking about, an unfailing strength that possesses you. And there's two things that this unfailing strength does according to this passage, two amazing things. Verse 11 says, I don't say this out of need, which is an amazing thing for a guy in a Roman jail cell to say. He says, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. So first off, this unfailing strength that we call contentment frees you of need. Paul was not desperate in this jail cell. In matter of fact, in kind of an almost backhanded way, he tells the Philippians, hey, I really appreciate that care package that kind of took its time getting to me, but I didn't need it anyway. That's an amazing thing for a guy who knows he might not live to see tomorrow, let alone the outside of his jail cell, to see. But that's what this unfailing strength does. It frees you of need. Right after this in verse 12, he says, I know both how to have a little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. So the second thing this unfailing strength does is it frees you from being a victim or a product of your circumstances. He says here that he knows how to have little. A lot of people have no idea how to have little without it absolutely causing them to lose their minds. But what Paul means when he says, I know how to have a little, he was well acquainted with what it was to have a little. What he means is that when God sees fit to lead him through a place where he just doesn't have a lot, that doesn't cause him to break down. He's not having panic attacks every half hour. He's not desperately, you know, requiring that other people come to rescue him or anxiously wondering, where's the next meal going to come from? Where's the next roof over my head going to come from? Am I even going to be alive tomorrow? It also, what this also means is that this unfailing strength frees you from the bitterness that develops in you when you look around at other people who seem like they're kind of cutting corners and they're not doing things right, and yet they seem happier and more successful than you. This unfailing strength totally breaks that power over you in my life. Paul also says, and I think this is even more incredible, he says that this unfailing strength not only taught him how to have a little, it taught him how to have a lot. Meaning that when God saw fit to bring Paul to the top of the mountain, which Paul had been there a time or two, Paul knew what it was like for people to worship him. In a place called Lystra. He didn't allow them to do that, but he knew what it was like to be a a celebrity. He knew what it was like to have power and fame and influence and all that kind of stuff, be hosted by some pretty wealthy people. But this unfailing strength allowed him to not even, uh, it, it broke that. It broke abundance's power over his life to change him in all the ugly ways that a whole lot of money and power and respect and fame tends to change people historically. That's what this unfailing strength does. So when I zoom out from that, what's real clear to me is everybody wants this. Regardless of what you believe, there's not a person alive that doesn't want what this passage of Scripture is talking about. Who in in their right mind isn't tired of feeling needy and dependent on other people or tired of going through life in a way that that you just allow the day-to-day kind of ebb and flow or what people say about you or how they treat you to make you or break you? That's not a fun way to go through life. 
what, what, what this passage of Scripture is, at its core, it's Paul explaining that he found the secret to this unfailing power and this unfailing strength that really changed his life in some ways that we would all want our lives to change. And in the next verse, Philippians 4.13, which happens to be, I think unequivocally, the most taken out of context verse in the Bible, Paul gives us the secret of this unfailing strength. Philippians 4.13 says this, I am able to do all things through him or Jesus or Christ who strengthens me. This is going to bring us to our first idea this morning. It's this. A relationship with Jesus is the only source of contentment. This verse, Philippians 4.13, gets used to say all kinds of things that I hope to prove unequivocally it was not meant to teach us. For instance, good, I love that. I love preaching this crowd. Let's get it. All right, let's do it. We're going to hurt some people today. Uh, you can Google image search if, uh, if you don't believe me. You can Google image search this when, uh, when, when you get home. Who here remembers the name Evander the Real Deal Holyfield? Show of hands. Yeah. All right. He's a bad man. Uh, the night that he boxed Mike Tyson and two-pieced Mike Tyson, if memory serves, he had this verse embroidered on his robe. I can assure you this, even though he beat Mike Tyson, he did not beat Mike Tyson because of what this verse is promising. But that's how so, and I would recommend that you not try to two-piece Mike Tyson claim in Philippians 4.13. It's probably not going to work out well for you. But that is how so many people, maybe they they actually interpret it, maybe they just really want to believe that that's what this verse says. That I can achieve any one of my goals. That I can get through any obstacle that stands between me and my definition of success. That every single one of my goals can be realized because Jesus strengthens me. You know what? I've always wondered what would happen. What if both boxers had that embroidered on their robe? Then what happens? Right? They just both go to heaven before the fight starts or something? That can't be what this verse means. And the reason that we know that is simply by looking at the state of the guy who wrote it. Paul was personally commissioned by Jesus, the risen son of God on the road to Damascus, to preach the gospel to the Roman Empire. And the way that I read the book of Acts, there is nothing that Paul loved doing more than that. But when God inspired him to write this passage of scripture, and specifically Philippians 4.13, he couldn't do what he loved anymore. And there was nothing he could do about it. I mean, leading up to the writing of of the letter of Philippians, I've, I've rehearsed this often, but it's really important to keep this in mind. He'd been falsely accused by his own countrymen, the people he dedicated his life to serving. He'd been denied justice by the Roman governmental authorities, left him on house arrest for years, knowing he was an innocent man. He had to appeal to Caesar to avoid dying in custody, so he got put on a slave ship, set sail across the Mediterranean. He gets caught in a storm that blows him so far off course, he almost dies at sea. He crash lands on an island, and just when he thinks the ordeal's over, he's warming himself around a fire, he gets bit by a snake. And at the time of actually writing this letter, it's not like he's looking back and saying, man, God's so good to bring me through all of that. No, he's still right in the middle of it. He's in a jail cell, chained to a Roman soldier that wants nothing more than to cut his head off so he can stop hearing about this Jewish carpenter named Jesus. And Paul doesn't know if he's ever going to live to see the outside of it. So when he says, I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me, he's not saying I can break these chains and body slam these guards and go roundhouse kick Caesar in the face. Of course, that's not what he meant. What he meant in context here is is that even though nothing in his life worked out the way that he'd hoped, even though he had arrived at a place that literally was rock bottom, I don't know how much lower you get, Unable to do the thing that you love. Separated from the people that you love. At the mercy of people that hate you. What Paul is saying is even if I never live to see the other side of this jail cell, what he's saying in these verses, he says, my relationship with Jesus has afforded me such an incredible strength that none of that matters. None of that has the power to define me because of my relationship with my Savior. That's power that money can't buy. That's freedom that you will not find anywhere else other than a relationship with Jesus. It's not because of Jesus I can get anything that I want. It's because of Jesus, even if I don't get anything that I want, I'm going to be just fine at the end of the day. Because a relationship with Jesus is the only source of contentment. Now let me just pause here. If we just left off at at, at, at where we are right now, this teaching would be largely useless to you and I. Because all we've really covered so far 
is that this guy named Paul had such an amazing relationship with Jesus that it, it gave him this contentment that went beyond how bad his life was. And if I was listening to that in your shoes and that's where we left off, that doesn't help me. Hearing how rock solid a guy who lived and died 2,000 years ago does not help me get through Monday. I'm guessing that that doesn't help you. So let me let you into my mind as a, as a preacher of this book. Here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to end this teaching by giving us, you know, two or three things that we can do in order to get to where Paul says he was. A couple of disciplines, a couple of practices so that we can arrive at this contentment. But I can't do that because that's not what this passage gives us. And as a preacher of God's word, I am confined to say what this book says and nothing more. And if God really wanted us to have a checklist of things that we could do in order to arrive at this place that Paul said he was in, we would be able to find it in this passage, but it's just not there. And I kept beating my head against the wall all week wondering, why would Paul just stop at saying, I learned this secret, but not tell us how he learned it? Or what he did so that we might do these things. The more that you zoom out from this, it's, it's, it's kind of wild actually. All he does is hold up his life as an example for these Philippian believers that he loved and cared about so much. All he does is hold up himself as an example of someone who's lost just about everything you can lose. But is happier and more content than the people he's writing to because of his relationship with Jesus. And the fact that that's all Paul does here under inspiration of God. Instead of give us a list or things that we can do, the fact that that's all he does here tells me that the purpose of this passage and Paul holding up his life is to get us to take a hard look at ours. So the more that I studied this, the more that it dawned on me that this passage is not given to us to tell us what we need to do. It's given to us so that we could have a question to ask. And that question is this. What have you told yourself you need in order to be content? See, all Paul is saying here is that he has finally arrived at this place in his life where all he needed was Jesus. He lost everything else. All he needed was Jesus. And that is the secret of contentment. It's about finding contentment in the one thing that nothing in this world can threaten or take away from us, which is our relationship with Jesus. And so seeing that in Paul should cause us to take a hard look at our lives and ask us, does that mindset really exist in ourselves? What is it that we've told ourselves we need in order to be content? Now that question might be really easy for some of us to answer if you think like this often, but for some of us that might be the first time we've ever even considered a question like that. And we might need to invite other people into our life, to speak into our life, to help us find the answer to that question. But the reason that it's so important that we ask ourselves this is because whatever your answer is to that question, whatever that thing is, that's what is currently taking the place that Jesus desires to have in your life. And the first step in finding the contentment that only a relationship with Jesus can give you is first finding out what is currently taking his place in your life. Whatever that thing is, it will never, ever give us what we think it will. And I don't know how many times I've quoted celebrities from David Foster Wallace to Madonna to Brad Pitt, or I don't know how many times we could look at a man like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, or case study after case study after case study in the Bible to be reminded over and over again of the reality that until Jesus is enough for us, nothing in this world will be. Twice in this passage, the same verbiage is used that caught my eye. Twice in this passage, talking about contentment, Paul says that he learned it. And the second time that he says it, he says he learned the secret of contentment. I I, I did some research on that. The Greek word that that Paul used there was used in the, uh, the Greek mystery religions that were so prevalent in Paul's day to describe somebody who had kind of work themselves up from the lower levels of one of these cults and kind of climb this ladder and finally arrived at the point where they had full access to this mystery that so few people had access to. A lot of religions were like that in Paul's day. And there's even some religions in our culture that are still around that kind of resemble that. Scientology is one of them. Um, the, the, The longer that you're in there and the higher that you climb, you get access to these documents and information. So what Paul is saying here is that contentment was not zapped into his life overnight, that this was 
uh, this was only taught to him. This was a lesson that he learned only through a wealth of experiences that God allowed him to have. And the further that I zoomed out from this passage, the more important it seemed to me that Paul was only able to write what we're reading in this passage after everything that God had led him through and was still walking him through while he wrote Philippians. In other words, it was only after Paul had been falsely accused of crimes he did not commit by the people he dedicated his life to serving. It was only after Paul had been denied justice. It was only after Paul knew what it was like to be tossed and turned at sea, not knowing if the next wave was going to be his last one. It was only after Paul knew what it was like to think he was finally at the end of his journey, warming himself around a campfire just to get bit by a snake. It was only after Paul had lost everything, finding himself in a Roman jail cell, that for all he knew, he would not live to see the outside of, that he could finally say, I've learned it. I've learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things, not because of my own strength, but because of a Savior who strengthens me. And what this tells us about the secret of contentment is our final idea this morning. It's that God uses loss to teach us contentment. There's a lot of passages in Scripture that their primary goal is to aim at our behavior, at what we do, to change what we do. There's also a lot of passages in Scripture that aim primarily at, at how we think and are meant to change how we think. And this passage of Scripture is the latter. There's not a command in here. Every instinct that we have teaches us to avoid loss and all the pain that comes with it at all costs. But passages like this challenge us and invite us to lean into loss and difficulty and hardship and pain and suffering and to look for God in those experiences. And not just to look for God in those experiences, but to ground ourselves in the confidence that there are certain things that God can do in us that are only possible because of the loss that he allows us to experience. And what I see in the life of Paul here, he's the poster child for this, that God so often will allow his children that he loves to experience incredibly painful things. He will allow us to lose things that we think we need. He will allow us, if necessary, to see our dreams go unfulfilled, never realized if that's what it takes to teach us contentment. And I realize this is not the kind of teaching that generally produces a round of applause on Sunday morning, but this is the truth. This is how it works. And I'm willing to bet that there's people listening to this right now that find themselves in a place like this. You know what it's like for nothing to work out the way that you planned. You know what it's like to lose things that you thought you needed. You know what it's like to have your hope set on something only to see it never come to fruition. You know how painful that is. Maybe right now God's walking you through something like that and you know something of what it must have felt like for Paul to be in that Roman jail cell. As difficult as those times are and as much as we would skip them on the front end if we had the choice, those can be some of the most important and defining times in our lives. Now I know this. I know that Paul hated, at least part of him hated Every moment that he spent in that jail cell, unable to do what he loved, unable to be with the people that he loved. And I know if we had a behind-the-scenes look in his life, we would see a man who battled with discouragement. We would see a man who dropped some tears on the, on the ground. We would see a man who questioned things that he thought that he knew. We would see somebody who was frequently face-to-face -face with the reality that he didn't know if he could go through this thing that God was walking him through for one more day. But I know in my heart of hearts that if Paul could speak to us today, he would say that if he could do it all over again, he wouldn't change a thing. Because if God had not brought him where God brought him, he would have never learned the secret of contentment. He would have never learned how strong Jesus was unless he'd become personally acquainted with his own weakness. He would have never learned that he could do all things through the strength of his Savior. And this is the great irony of how God works. If Paul had never found himself in jail, he would have never been truly free. So we're going to close this service with communion. And during communion, God's word commands us to examine ourselves. And while you take the bread and the juice during this final song, I just want to ask you to ask yourselves, what have you told yourself you need in order to be content?
Whatever that thing is, Jesus desires to take its place in your life, and God will allow you to lose those things that you think that you need, even if it means causing you a great deal of pain, not because he's angry at you, but because he loves you, and he wants to set you free the way that Paul was set free. Because it's so often that our hearts only learn that Jesus is all we need when he really is all that we have. I want to close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. I've always loved this. He said, Believer, if your inheritance be a lowly one, you should be satisfied with your earthly portion, for you may rest assured that it is the fittest for you. Unerring wisdom ordained your lot and selected for you the safest and best condition. Remember this, had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. You were placed by God in the most suitable circumstances, and if you had the choosing of your lot, you would soon cry, Lord, choose my inheritance for me, for by my self-will I am pierced through with many sorrows. Be content with such things as you have, since the Lord has ordered all things for your good. Take up your own daily cross. It is the burden best suited for your shoulder and will prove most effective to make you perfect in every good word and work to the glory of God. That's it. That's all.